Thanks very much, Aaron, and thank you um, for the acknowledgement to country. As you heard, I usually live at the Darawal lands, uh, but at the moment I'm actually in St. Moritz on holidays. Um, my father comes from the Grishun canton or the state, and um, so I'm here to kind of revisit my past and show my husband around what's happening. Um, I have a bit of funny light uh, because it is actually midnight or just past midnight here in St. Moritz. So I'm having a bit of fun at the midnight party. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for joining this talk. And I hope you get a lot out of the presentation and I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if you could put that in the chat, that would be fantastic as well. So I'm just going to share my screen and you have to apologize. I only have one screen, so you will see what I'm actually going to be sharing. Okay. I hope that's come up all right at your end. Can you let me know once you see the slides, please? Uh, yes, I can see the slides. Yeah, excellent. Okay, then we'll get started. Uh, now I can see very little of you, so I hope um, if there's any questions or people putting their hands up, um, Ivan, if you could I let me that. know, no problem. that would be great. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so I would like to share with you with my knowledge and experiences around transformation and, and assessing it um, so it meets expected outcomes. And the reason for that is that we have still a lot of failure. Um, we have a lot of failure in change management or change it itself and transformation just builds on change and it's just so much bigger. And we actually find that only, you know, five to 12% of transformations meet expected outcomes. 75% of those um, generally have been called back. So executives have to live with less than what they expected. And it, it creates a lot of problems in regards to competitive advantage, um, making sure the organization is actually going to be able to do what it is intending to do. So what I hope with this presentation today is to give you a basis of what the transformation needs to be, um, what needs to happen in the transformation so it can, you can start working towards these expected outcomes. So I have three objectives. First of it is to understand or create a holistic foundation um, about the language that we use. Um, I think there is a lot of confusion out there and I want to make sure that we all understand, have the same understanding in this room. The second is, is how does culture actually derail transformation? What are the models that I'm working with that might help you into the future? And the third one is the assessment around transformation itself. So let's look at the first one, the foundation of holistic transformation. So when we build the case um, for holistic transformation management, there is four areas that uh, McKinsey and company have found that create uh, financial value, but there is also loss of financial value that can occur in those four areas. So the first one is target setting second planning, implementation, and then after the implementation. And you see in the boxes the respective percentage of value loss, financial value loss, that is, that can occur. So we have a process happening that along this way, you can, you know, 55% of your value loss is already in the implementation process. And after go live of say an ICT implementation, you still have um, a lot of loss happening as well. So just when you think, okay, we just got this project to this stage, you, you've just got to keep going. You've got to keep, have that momentum going, have, um, that momentum happening. So you don't have that value loss occurring. And I found those numbers quite staggering. And it tells me that we need to pay attention to not just the planning or the target setting, but we need to really pay attention what happens in that implementation space as well. Okay, so what I wanna clear up first is what is change and what is transformation? And you can see on this slide that um, I have a set of criteria, so strategy, purpose, time frame, et cetera. And the change is really um, in, this, in the middle column and the transformation in the right column. 
So the strategy of change is to make the past better while transformation is actually focusing, a new, uh, focusing on shaping a new future. So they have very different foci in, in how, they, uh, how we need to approach transformation. And you can see from that, that transformation is a much longer time span than the change itself. And it usually has an external rationale. So it's the organization that has to adapt to the outside, or to society, for example, and its expectations, such as the sustainability and the climate change actions that are happening um, nowadays. The, the domains are also bigger. So for change, the domains are systems, processes, the structures and governance and the technology and individual behaviors. Uh, which you see that these are more tangible things. While for transformation, you also need to consider culture and people's mindset and attitudes. So I use this four levers framework, which helps me understand uh, where these areas sit. So like a tree, change sits in behaviors and systems in the environment. So they are visible while transformation is down in the values, beliefs, and assumptions of the culture, but also individuals. And it's hidden in an organization. So it takes a little bit of time to uncover these two areas, um, simply for the fact that you have to work in an area to understand its culture. Usually a person is in, in the culture or are cultured within about three to six months. With the online environment, it takes a little bit longer to understand the culture and see what the norms are and the values of this organization. Um, it also takes a little bit longer to understand the, the beliefs of why all of this happens and what assumptions are contributing to the culture in the organization. So what is culture? Um, usually what you find on websites are stated values. So we value um, achievement or we value customer service. And then often there's a little bit of a, a statement underneath that. To me, these are aspirational and they are strategic intent. They are not actually the culture of an organization. It's kind of wishful thinking. This is what we would like to be. We can only say that that matches uh, the culture if that is the actual lived experience within an organization. And again, it, that takes a little bit uncovering it because it is hidden. Uh, a customer coming into the organization will not understand what the culture is of that organization. Neither will uh, a person that is starting new, as I mentioned before. When we talk about culture, there's four areas we need to talk about. That is the norms. So norms are collective social behaviors. Um, values is what's important in the organization and beliefs are the way we behave or the way we think that these values are to be lived and the assumptions are the myths behind the beliefs. So a, a, an example that we probably are all familiar with is family. Uh, we all would say that family is a value of ours. Um, but the belief of what a family looks like and what it does is, can be very different. Um, so you can have a traditional family of, of a mom and a dad with a couple of children, or you can have a hybrid family, um, you can have a mixed family, you can have a single family. And it's just the assumptions behind it of what you think is actually acceptable. And it's the same in a culture in an organization. Um, when we don't have these four things together, and we don't pay attention to these four things, we don't actually are able to fully grasp what the culture is like. The way the culture surfaces is through stories and symbols. So the sort of things that um, in stories, the sort of things that are being addressed in town hall meetings, for example, or, or the sort of things that are in newsletters, that is what's important in that organization and that gets legs. And the symbols, uh, the best one I can give you um, is basically a parking space for VIPs in the organization, say, for example, board of directors, CEO, CEO excuse me, 
um, or some other C-suite staff, but no one else gets a, a designated car parking space. That is symbolism in, in regards to what's important for this organization. And that's just one example. Um, there's lots and lots of other symbolisms happening in organizations. So what's culture not? So the stories and the symbols link us to the, what's visible in the tree. And so what's the, what culture is not is things like the power structure, the control systems, the structure of the company, or the rituals and the routines that are happening. Now, there's been some really interesting research from Grant Thornton um, around the work environment and how it contributes to a healthy culture. And they actually found that only 14% of the actual work environment supports a healthy culture. So if you're looking at a, a big renovation within the office space, don't expect that your culture will change coming out of that. Um, I guess that was their key message at the time. The second point I want to make um, here is that when we talk about employee engagement, it is actually a climate measure. It is actually something that arises out of culture, but climate um, employee engagement is not a culture measure. And a lot of people seem to confuse that um, particular fact. So I've just come out of an organization where they use culture amp, and despite the name having culture in it, they are this particular tool actually measures employee engagement and not culture. And you will see through the, the talk that as I get on why that is actually important. So just the last slide of this foundation setting is uh, measuring climate or culture. So it mentioned the engagement uh, surveys, but also satisfaction surveys um, within the organization, they measure climate. And they are influenced by the mood of the time. So if you have a bad announcement today and you would set that um, survey up uh, at the moment and send it to the employees, they would reflect that announcement in the answers that they would give. It is, uh, it is something that people might do or not do. So it's not the actual, it's a perception around it. And often engagement surveys uh, or organizational effectiveness surveys for that matter, they're kind of uh, based on positive social bias. Um, so what that means is that when you provide an answer, you will provide an answer that you think is also of benefit. It will keep you in the organization. And so it has that social bias in, in included in it. And the results for, of these surveys help with making improvements. Now, when we talk about culture, it's really about, the, as I mentioned before, the lift experience, the lift collective norms and the values and beliefs. So what's important and why we believe it's important. It is not something that will actively change unless we put a lot of work and a lot of effort into making the change happen. And that is part of the transformation work that needs to happen. It is an activity that needs to be happen and it needs to happen very consciously and you need to put your mind to it so it can happen. So it's, uh, it's very different to the climate measures. We also need to find the hidden culture norm it's that this is the norm that um, when, when you break that norm, you get collective sanctioning for non-compliance. And it's very interesting to find that hidden culture norm because that is usually what can stop a transformation in its tracks. So one example that I have for you is uh, I was working in an organization which was hugely positive and it was absolutely fabulous working there because everybody had such a, a good positive attitude about their work and the organization and their clients. But when I worked there a little bit longer and started to, to identify the culture and diagnose it, I identified that nobody could really talk about anything that was negative. So it, or just the perception that it was negative or a challenge was not not acceptable and people were sanctioned because they did that. 
And it didn't just happen in one business unit. It happened across multiple business units. And that's why I understood that this was the hidden culture rule. And what the consequence of that was is that people could not actually learn because they could not have had challenging conversations. They were actually unable to learn um, anything new. They were not able to look past that challenge. And that stopped the transformation in its track. Um, it was very difficult for people to adapt to new things and actually see past the positivity. Now, culture helps you understand the lived experience. Um, as I mentioned before, I just want people to be very clear about that, what culture does. So at this stage, this is kind of the foundation to have a common language that we understand what's, what we talk about when it comes to transformation. And I know that change and transformation are often used interchangeably. I also know that engagement and culture are often used interchangeably. And I hope that by clarifying some of these cultural terms, um, you will be able to articulate that uh, better with your students or clients, etc. Uh, just before we go on, just want to check, was there any questions, Ivan, around this piece? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, uh, what everyone, everyone who's got a question, do you want to like, just share their insights? Um, yeah, I had a question. This is something um, I posted in chat, uh, but probably our chat has been quite um, um, pleasingly busy. Um, so it, it's, it, it all really makes sense. Um, so it seems like to make the transformation happen, we rely on the things in people's head, in their mind, in their mood. Um, so what are the things we can actually do to to influence bit by bit? Or it, it, is it actually comes down to how the leaders and the leader of leaders behave or who they are? Yeah, you know, that is, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, Sunny. Um, I'll show you a model in the next section around um, how culture constructs in an organization and how it will influence on transformation. But yes, leaders have a huge job um, responsibility when it comes to culture and culture change or culture transformation, uh, definitely. Um, if you think about the, the model that I showed you before, the four leaders model, um, each individual brings their own values, beliefs, um, and assumptions to work. And if a leader has certain types of values and beliefs, they will influence with those, the decision-making in the organization, how things happen, the hierarchy, um, how they work or empower people. And I think one of the things that we, um, that I see constantly is that staff in transformation, they really need to be empowered um, to make that transformation happen. And if, if the culture is not inclined or if the leader is not inclined in that way, then that becomes actually a challenge. So yes, leaders have a huge uh, influence. Um, Craig Safian, who is also on the call, Today, he spoke a couple of months ago about transformational leadership. Um, I'm not sure if we can share that part, Ivan, with the, the group in this room, but it might be worthwhile to look actually what that transformational leadership looks like. I don't talk about that today because I don't have enough time. Okay, I'll share the playlist um, of Craig's insights in the chat. In fact, if anybody, if, if anybody can subscribe, if you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and actually have a look at all the playlists that we've had, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. So the next section, we look at the power of culture to influence the transformation and the way it can derail it. Uh, I want to share with you some models that I use, and I just want to explain this. So what I have identified is that there are certain culture traits or values that are required in a transformation space. Um, and I've come across this model. Now, some of you may know that it's called Spiral Dynamics. Um, it was developed in the 1950s and taken on by a gentleman, two gentlemen called um, Don Beck um, and Chris Cohen. Um, basically, what they have done is they have identified that there is values uh, groups or value systems or memes 
And these are reflected on the screen by the different colors. So we have eight memes at the moment, um, and they'll each have a different perspective on how they work and what, what their focus is. Um, and th the focus also is either collective in a we or the, it is individual in, in a me. So that means that we either have a collective culture or we have an individualistic culture, depending on which value system we are as an organization describing to. The second thing of note is that this is actually a developmental system. So an organization doesn't necessarily need to stay with one value system. So for example, I've, I've undertaken a, a study on banks. Uh, I had a friend who worked in the bank since the 1980s. Uh, we had a conversation around what the culture in banks was like in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, etc. Uh, what we identified through the conversation was that in the 80s, it was a very heavy blue duty and order kind of culture within banks. And they were there for, uh, they, it was very collective. They were there for the community. Then with the deregulation, that changed to a achievement culture. They became more strategic. There was you know, competitiveness uh, was enhanced. And the relationships that uh, had been built during that collective culture started to fall away. These days, banks are trying to have more of an equality and cohesion-based culture. And we know from the um, Royal Commission, that actually there was a lot of complacency, um, a lot of um, consensus, and that is very much a green equality kind of um, trait within, a, in, within that particular value system. So we understand that internally the, the banks were acting that way, but externally they were still acting across the orange meme. And so the interesting part of this is that an organization can shift across these value systems but generally they have one um, key, uh, key value system as their, their culture, and they might subscribe to one, two, or maximum three other value systems as subgroups. And they, they, they lend themselves, they lend from those value systems um, aspects that either they are growing out of, because they're developing, or they're growing into. Uh, and so organizations can shift in their culture depending on the life expectancy, like the circumstances that uh, are posed on them. And, and that gives me hope that culture can actually shift in organizations because there is those external pressures on them. Now, what I've identified with, with transformation is that the norms essentially need to come from each of these value systems. So what I just said, most organizations only subscribe to one key a group, key value system, and they may have two to three subgroups. But with transformation, you do need to have values from each of those eight value systems. And I think that's a key message that it took me ages to, to really get to understand this. Um, so I'm delivering that to you in like one minute. But it's basically, if you can't produce, um, say for example, empathy with the people, if you cannot understand um, diversity as a thought, but also in demographics, if, you are, uh, if you're struggling with agility in your organization, or providing stability and structure, or if you have a foundational issue around respect and that people don't respect each other, which means they don't trust each other either, then transformation is going to be difficult. And the leaders, and that's Sunny, where the leaders are really important, they need to try to unite their people behind the transformation. And that is a big challenge because a lot of organizations we still see are very hierarchical. And, and it's not about uniting people, it's people doing work and being a, you know, kind of a cog in the system. And if we have that in the transformation, then that's going to be a challenge. Now, the second part is showing the beliefs and the assumptions that are required. 
So when we look at the beliefs, um, there is a whole set of beliefs that we need to have in place for these norms to come to life. And these are the ones that are required, that I have identified through research that are required for transformation. Now, what you may find here is, um, and I would like to, to give a little bit of a, a, an example again around a, an organization that I have been part of um, that had a, a very strong orange achievement culture. And what they were measuring in that uh, organization was EBIT, growth, um, and the revenue and business development. So sales, lead generation, that's the sort of measures that they had in the organization. Now, when we were implementing um, an ICT system there, and if you think about um, when, when an executive needs to make a decision around their staff focusing on EBIT and growth versus providing their staff to contribute to a project, you have a, a natural tension there between those things because a project will always take key staff members away from their BAU and their deliverables in BAU. And that happens in all projects, doesn't matter what type, if, whether they're ICT, sustainability, um, diversity, staff need to learn something new and that takes time. They need to contribute uh, through their stakeholder engagement. Um, they need to make decisions, etc. And so their focus is not on their BAU work. And so what happened in that organization was very simple. The executive was focused on EBIT, that the staff had the directive to focus on that. And the project literally came to a stalemate um, because we could not get access to the staff to do the work that was necessary for the project and the consultation around that. And that's what happened in this particular organization with a strong orange um, value system. So in the assumptions that we need for transformation in this particular example is that measurements are not just financial and there needs to be shared accountability for results. And when I say shared accountability, it's not accountability within one business unit, but it's accountability that goes across the executive. We need to align the executives behind the results and they are all accountable for the same results. Otherwise, we just if it's by business unit, you're going to have problems. Uh, these problems always surface, as I mentioned in that ex example. If we are not making, um, if we are not sharing that load, that, that accountability load, and if we are not making sure that the executives are aligned, we're going to have individualism happening. And the orange me, and as you can see in the focus, is an individual or an individualized kind of culture anyway. So it's just enhancing the problem that we already have. So that's just one example of how these value systems can work and how they can create problems within organizations, but then it can also strengthen them. So an achievement culture usually is very good at problem solving. They often can be very innovative and they actually have already learned to delegate decision-making. Um, some of the previous, is that these, these um, value systems are developmental, anything before the orange meme, so the, the, the survival, the relational, um, the power and the duty meme, they don't actually have kind of learned that delegated decision-making at this stage. So I could say a lot more about this slide and about this model. Um, it is, it has been you know, a 10-year journey for me to, to actually get all of this. So what I want you to take away from that is that we need to be able to expand our culture beyond what is the key focus. We need to understand that we need to be able to have certain norms in place for transformation to happen. We need to understand what the beliefs for these norms should be like. Um, and the assumptions behind that. And if they are clashing what currently is within the organization, then that is going to be an impediment to the transformation and it will help derail it. Interesting. 
Yeah, is, is, do we want to just maybe see if anyone has a, a question about that or if I need to explain something more? Yeah, Claudia, Sunny again. Um, this is so different to everything that I've heard about cultural transformation or transformation. Um, I'm still digesting. So, um, so mm -hmm. if, if we get everyone in the organization to become orange me, is that alignment? <laughs> No, so what I'm saying is what, what you probably will have is um, in the organization, you will have one key value system. So in this particular example that I gave, the value system was strongly in the orange achievement culture. Mm. Um, and it, was, it, it came through the KPIs that this organization set itself and its business units. And it, as I said, it had impediments. So mm. no, I don't. Uh, I don't expect organizations to become one of these. What I need, what I'm saying is that whatever the organization has. So, for example, governments often sit in a blooming, mm. um, and they have something a, a strength from that. But by not having an understanding of other values that need to be coming together that are inherent in other value systems. Mm, yeah. um, they actually are derailing themselves. They are actually missing out on things that are needed to make a transformation work. Right. So that does present a huge challenge, isn't it? it totally. Yes, mm. it is a huge challenge. It's, that's why I was so keen to talk mm. uh, to people like yourselves. Um, because it's actually a huge education piece that needs to happen, I think, amongst yeah. executives and C like C-suites and senior managers mm. in, in smaller organizations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, what uh, you all of this is mm. All of this is based on research. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it was little pieces of information from one mm. article to another. Like, okay. It would be, it would be great. It would be great to discuss these in the think tanks. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Claudia, it's it's Mark Purr, but can I just ask? I, I find this fascinating because um, with with our team analysis tool we have, we've never used it for transformation before. But mm -hmm. but I can see how how if you can identify the people that have the core hard wiring for each of those what seven different or eight different areas, then that would actually provide or would it provide leaders with the opportunity to understand which people should be on the on the transformation team and which parts exactly. of the transformation they should be in. That's exactly right, Mark. Um, it's, uh, and I was going to come to your tool as, as an aid to understand um, who you're recruiting and what kind of skills you might actually need, um, you know, to, to bring in in the organization. Um, and the other part is also that influencers are part of a transformation strategy. Um, you need to understand who the influencers are and what they're actually bringing in regards to those norms. I have seen um, people who are not in leadership position, or not in positional leadership, I should say, but they are influencers within the organization who are absolutely fantastic as, at integrating people. These are the kinds of people. So it's not an we don't expect the executive to 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 gain all of these skills. I guess the, the, the key skill an executive needs to understand and learn from is really to, to value other people and what they bring to the organization and tap into their strengths and make that happen. So if, if they have integrators in their organization, let's bring them in because they are the ones that can bring the people along and help them make that shift happen. If they have people in, in kind of their yellow mean who, you know, are great at design, they have systemic thinking, they can really think through a transformation and how it should work and how the different pieces move together. Let's them be, let them become advisors to the executive about what they see happening in the organization. But you've got to, of course, recognize those people first. And I think your tool, Mark, would probably help with that aspect of it. Um, what, I, what I do is I use this model to do culture diagnostics in general. So I don't work at the individual level with this. Um, I do organizational culture diagnostics with this to, to give executives advice around what they have as strengths within their culture and what it is that they need to look for and what else they need to build into the organization if they haven't got it. 
So that's how I use this model. So it's not just about understanding what is in the organization, but also what's not there. And I think that's a different way of looking at culture again, about looking at what's not within the culture that um, most people don't really kind of look at. They just want to know what they have and what might be desired, but not what is actually needed in the that's organization. Great. Claudia, that's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, I'll move on. Um, so just to the, the arrow that I've just put up is basically to build your transformation capabilities, uh, because as I mentioned, it is a, a developmental tool. Um, and maybe one more thing um, I did mention about EBITs as financial measures. What actually becomes much more important for transformation is cash flow, um, understanding cash flow. Now I've been on boards and uh, they did not have cash flow reports and I would strongly recommend uh, anyone who doesn't have them to implement those because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the EBIT can kind of derail a transformation while cash flow will tell you if you can continue with it. Okay, so I'd like to talk about the three paradigms for the transformation. And you see, on I guess it's on my left side on the screen, um, is the, the paradigm. And the, on the right hand, we have the drivers of culture. And I will also talk about decision making in this piece as a really important piece to make a transformation happen. Okay, so the first paradigm is really at the top, at the organization level, and it's the drivers are the board, the CEO and the senior executives. So what I find is when we talk about um, silos, we generally talk about horizontal silos, but actually with culture also found that we have vertical silos. So the first one would be at that organizational level. So the senior executive will have a very different culture than what might happen in other areas. Like for example, the workplace, which is your second paradigm. Now this is driven by the location or division executive. And that comes back to Sunny's question, how leadership influences culture in an organization. So each location could, for example, have a different culture. Now the colors you see in that particular graph relate to different cultures. So for example, you could have at the orange, at the organizational level, you could have a very strong orange achievement focus, but actually in the business units, you might have more of an egalitarian green culture or maybe a relational culture in purple. And the reason that is important is that that's the first, the third podium is you, I'm sorry, um, I'm just with decision making. Um, the board and the CEO and the executive make the mission critical decisions. So they answer the why and the purpose, or about 1% of decisions. And the senior executives, they make business critical decisions, which is about the what of the vision and the resources. And that's about 4% of the decisions. And that's for a transformation, that's how it should work. But what you find in organizations often is that they're very hierarchical and decisions are made by the executive. And so you imagine that many, many decisions that have to be made in a, in a project. So an ICT project, for example, the, the, lots of decisions have to be made there. Um, they all seem to, in a hierarchy, they all seem to filter up to the executive and the executive literally becomes overloaded with you know, make a decision, understanding the problem, having time to think this through and make the right decision. And what this model does by, by separating out the mission critical and business critical decisions and saying, well, the executive is responsible for those and all the decisions will come into the operational level. And I'll come to that in just a moment. But with coming back to the colors, um, the third level of, of the culture is team and ambiguity culture. And ambiguity culture is usually in a project. So a project team is assembled out of consultants and contractors or subcontractors, some permanent staff, some SMEs um, who are coming into the project team. And it's sort of this hodgepodge of people. Now, I've, I've made, made those smiley faces all blue because it's actually a real example that I've had where 
the project team was really, really much, very much in a, that kind of uh, duty and order kind of space. They were very focused on processes. They wanted people to just adopt the processes that they set up um, for this particular system. Um, it was an enterprise resource planning system that we were implementing. And they were clashing with the culture of a more egalitarian, collaborative kind of work group. So with, with the, the uh, value system around duty and order, it's actually usually uh, I tell and sell you what you need to know and you just do what you do because it's a hierarchy-based kind of um, culture. While in a egalitarian culture, you want consultation, you want people to participate and all that. So the project team was actually clashing with the business, okay, because they had those two different cultures. Now that totally derails it because people just don't understand each other. So the project team doesn't understand the business and the business doesn't understand the project team simply because they, what, what they value and their norms are totally different. And so the first piece of work really that needs to happen is we need to, to try to align these guys so they can start working to each other. Uh, we had the same issue with that blue culture in a, in a purple relational culture, very networked um, business units. You know, they were, they were trusting the people they, they had been working with for a long time. Now comes this project team that is kind of hierarchical, tells you what to do. It's not interested in relationships. Um, we've had, it's, just, it's just created so many clashes that it was actually derailing the transformation. It was very visible to me, but it's obviously more difficult um, for, for business people to understand what's actually going on. Um, and of course they blame each other. The business blames the project team, the project team blames the business. And so you've got this blame game happening um, and you come to a stalemate. It's really fascinating to see that and then try to untangle that um, and, and get people to understand each other and actually make the time to do this work is also a challenge. And yet it's vital because if we don't take the time to do this work, to understand each other better, we're just going to go into rabbit holes uh, more and more and things are derailing more and more. So when it comes to decision-making at this stage, um, the project teams uh, or the teams in that ambiguity culture, they really should be focused on implementation critical decisions. And that's about how the work is happening. Um, and that is 95% of decisions. And these operational decisions should no longer go to executives. And that is sometimes really, really difficult for executives to understand and to deal with because it, whatever has happened in the past, they're making decisions that has worked for them, that has worked for their business unit. It, the, people have been very successful in that, but unfortunately that doesn't work for transformation. So I just want to stop here and see if there's any questions around that. I know I'm giving you lots and lots of information. So, Claudia, we've got five more minutes uh, before we Okay. Go. Thanks. Well, I'll probably need probably 10. So let's look at assessing the transformation. So these are the essentials. So what you have here on the table is on the left, you have the change. And on the right, you have the transformation piece. And the transformation also needs the change. So the tra for transformation, you need everything on this slide. If you're just doing a change, as I mentioned to you before, the difference between change and transformation. So if you're only doing a change, you only need that change column. So when we look at the executive, um, you need active sponsorship for change, but you also need it for transformation. Um, in transformation, you actually need an aligned executive with the same goals and targets and shared accountability. And they need to be able to create the synergy and unity within the organization, whether that is through their own leadership or by getting that vertical position, uh, vertical leadership and sponsorship happening in the organization, which is in the second row, the leadership role. When it comes to the driving change, 
it's usually visible and ongoing commitments enough, but for transformation, we really need to be visionary. And it's a long-term commitment, as I mentioned before, five to 10 years of, of you know, commitment that you need to make. You see the organization requirements also vary. So for change, it's usually, you know, the resource allocation for capital and IT, but for transformation, you also need to allocate resources for talent and talent management. And what I mean with that is learning and development at big time. So in change, you usually deal with training and some behavioral changes. But in transformation, you want to make sure that you can keep your key talent, because if you don't, your transformation is going to become more difficult. Um, and that's we're going to see that in the next slide, actually, that staff turnover, it's not just about measuring the staff numbers of staff leaving, it's actually also checking out who is leaving the organization. Is it the talent? Is it our influences who are leaving? Because what I've been finding is that it is the people who um, who we really need in the organization who are going because they get fed up with the way things run and they go and look for a job somewhere else, hoping that it will be better. And so that's one of the key points that I wanted to make. And I know there's a lot of information and you might like to just take a picture of this, this slide um, to, to I'll, look I'll at that. I'll, I'll post that on the LinkedIn uh, chat yeah. and I'll post okay. the chat to you. Okay. So with change, it's okay to have a developing project management and change management practice, but really with transformation, it really needs to be mature. And because of that, a lot of organizations need to bring in capability to be able to drive that. But they also need, executives also need to acknowledge that these people have specialist skills that the organization can learn from to make the transformation happen. And the last piece in this slide here is the learning requirements. And the learning requirements are, as I mentioned before, training focus and change, but in transformation, you need adaptive learning and you need new capabilities beyond the role. So if you're looking at culture change or transformation, I should rather say, that is a, a new capability that someone needs to gain. That is not something that is role specific. Um, and what I find in organizations, open feedback and creating open feedback loops is probably what a very one of the hardest things that can happen. Um, feedback is not always valued, particularly if you need to give feedback to executives. Um, and yet when we talk about open feedback loops, they need to include the executives. So a staff member should be able to give an executive feedback if they think that there's something that the executive needs to know about. And that is, of course, a, a challenge because we still have some, you know, there's all sorts of cognitive biases coming into that, that kind of thing. And people don't always know how to give feedback or welcome feedback. And yet it's, it's actually vital. Um, just on that slide, Claudia. Um, yep. uh, hi, sorry, everyone. It's uh, Rohan, CEO for Invigor Group. Um, very interesting stuff so far. So thank you so much. Um, the slide actually before regarding cultural traits necessary for transformation. It's 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 mm -hmm. um, ironic that coming from a sales background, it's the exact same cultural traits you need to succeed from generating sales to, to creating a good um, culture within the company and then successful transformational change, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now moving to the slide that you were just on just before, um, I would see one of the biggest barriers being uh, it's all too hard or it's all too expensive or it's all too um resource heavy to commit to doing this properly right so then we end up taking shortcuts uh, and i'm sure you've seen that in your experience um what would you how would you suggest for a small to medium company to address all of these if you're time poor if you're resource poor uh and you need to get things done quickly in in today's world yeah okay so i think one thing that we need to acknowledge is that a project 
takes time from the business to do it. Um, I don't have, I'm not a gold, like I don't have a, a glass or crystal ball to tell you which is the best way to go about yeah. that. But that needs to be acknowledged at the executive level. I think that will be your first step. And often that is where, it, where it's actually missing. Like it, the understanding of that fact is actually missing. And that's why the other thing is that you cannot really be on a growth trajectory or focus on EBIT, so, so profits, um, when you're doing transformation. Because if you do that, your focus is in a totally different space. And that's why I say you need to focus on cash flow. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's a really big shift for executives because we've been so profit focused in Australia, probably. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so making that shift to cash flow. So as long as your cash flow is sound and it can manage with having a project team and that, that and, and you know that is supporting the business in implementing that project, then that should be that I think that should be your main driver. And being very clear about if you're going for a transformation strategy, um, can you really afford to do a growth strategy as well? Is that really like, because what you're essentially doing is you, you, you're pulling two things into opposite directions. Um, it, it is, and, and it is focusing on, with the transformations, focusing on where do you get the quick wins first? So where do you get, you know, how you talked about before, they can do things fast. So what is it that you can do fast and get some results really quickly? So one, people see that it's a positive, um, there's something positive happening in an organization and it's working for the organization. I think so that needs to be factored into the transformation planning. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if that helps you. I say each Look, it does, it does help. And I the think cultural, that's... the cultural impacts also play a factor in this. So that's why I kind of say it's, you know, I haven't got a crystal ball. So yeah. And look, it does help, and I think you're you're saying the right things, and I think that's required. Um, just the comment about, um, you know, you can't do transformational change whilst focusing focusing on profit is nerve wracking to any any business. But I think if, like you say, from an executive level, it's understood that this is a important transformation that needs to happen for accelerated growth in the future, then we just need to pause a few things because, like you said, you are pulling the exact same resources in two different directions. Yeah, Good. that's exactly you, right. And, and sorry, people Jordi, will know I'll what have, you Jordi, prioritize. Jordi, I'll have to stop because you've got a hard close at 9.30. Sorry. Okay. I'm just, just going to go. These are the, the, these are the two slides. I'll just, I'll be sharing the slides afterwards, Simon. I'm yes, happy yeah. to. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. So I'll just talk to this one and explain what that means. And I'll explain what the other one means. So using my four levers model, I have identified um, the sort of things that you need to actually look at and measure. Okay, and so uh, I've mentioned before that it's not all about financial measures. So you see on this slide that there's a lot of things in here that are not necessarily um, financial. So the, the way we've start, started off is we need to have strategic KPIs and targets and aligned across the executive. And then we need to have aligned project benefits um, that are financial and non-financial. So we can identify whether the projects are actually realizing the benefits that we intended. And as I said, they need alignment with strategic KPIs and the transformation KPIs or the transformation targets. The way to, to align all of this is to have transformation goals for all employees. And of course, all of this needs to be aligned. Otherwise, um, it, you know, it, as we just talked about, if you have divergence happening there, people will focus on the things that they're measured on, the things that they're performance managed on. Um, within the implementation space, you have a project assurance and you need to understand that the BAU and the project velocity need to be aligned as well. So that's the speed at which the project needs to deliver, needs to be a speed or needs to be a resources that are allocated to that project. So if you want to run the project really fast, your BAU staff will have to provide more of the FTE to the project to support that project velocity. And that is, very, that is not very well understood, but it is an easy measure for you to check. If the project is derailing, check whether the, this, this velocity alignment is actually one of the issues. 
Okay, so it's an easy assessment for you to do. Um, so we've been, usually what we have when you measure transformation, we have financial measures, but you see that there's all sorts of things in there that, that are actually really important. Um, I've mentioned the culture diagnostic, the speed of decision-making and accountability and consequences before. We also need to look at the mindset and look at um, coaching and the return on investment on coaching. We need to look at how are we generating the diversity of thought and ideas and how, do they, how are they shared across the organization and do we welcome this? Or uh, you know, uh, is anybody listening to people and actually taking this stuff into consideration? Or are we just going listening and nodding and then it gets forgotten again? And that's a mindset shift that needs to happen in that space. The same with the feedback and the cognitive biases that I've mentioned before. And there's a whole lot of things around the behaviours um, that are really essential for transformation to happen as well. So with the weekly executive briefings, for example, um, do, they, do they actually have purpose and outcomes or are they just talk fests? I've seen too many talk fests in meetings, I can tell you. So just these are simple things that can be assessed, uh, but sometimes it needs somebody that's outside the organization that can get a clear picture of what's happening. Because when you are cultured in the organization, you don't see that anymore because it's just normal. It's what's expected. It's what you're used to. Okay. Just bring everything up, I think. Sorry for the few clicks. This is the same information that we've had on the previous slide placed back into the different uh, areas that are creating values loss within the organization. Recall one of the first slides I showed about the values loss, the, the, the financial value loss. So I've put each of these um, measures that I've had before into its relevant place. Okay, and you can see in the purple, that's the, all the cognitive biases that can get in the way in making decisions. And they're right across all areas. You see, culture diagnostics needs to happen throughout the whole process because you need to identify on an ongoing basis what gets in the way. And of course, the behaviors as well, they are, they are right across. They need to go from, you know, you need to start from target setting all the way to the after the implementation space. 